Most of the times, the things that we post and the pictures that we take are not reality. They are staged at best. And what would you be thought of if you're only known by the pictures that you take or the pictures that you post? See, sometimes what we look at is a staged event through filters than we do with reality. And so often we live our life through pictures of what people want to think of us than what reality truly is of us. Sometimes we post our pictures about our vacations and our trips and we get everybody posted right looking good and they take that picture and you post that picture. But in reality, right before that picture was taken, there was a knockdown drag out. And you had to call everybody in to take that picture because not every time we take a picture is not what reality truly is. What is the space between reality and purpose? Reality and joy. Where are you the most vulnerable? Because most times what we think we want people to see is what we put out there, but what we put out there in a lot of cases is not true. We see a picture of somebody and we say, oh, that's what they look like now. In reality, that's what they look like for two seconds after the photographer said, put your hand here, fix your eyes here, tilt your head here, and they take a picture and then you're happy with it. And you know the only good picture that you take is the one that you look good in. Your sister or your brother, your husband, your wife, I don't care what they look like as long as I look good. And you would pick your good picture even if it made somebody else look bad because you look good. If somebody else would pick the picture and they look bad, you know what they would say? Delete, delete, delete. Jim Patton takes pictures here a lot. You know that. Jim Patton has no filter on what he posts. I guarantee you, every time he takes a picture, my mouth is open, and you're saying, well, it's open all the time. But if I need him to take a picture straight ahead, no profile picture at all, but he doesn't. He moves around, he takes pictures, and there are no filters on his pictures. And I make a joke about this all the time in the office. I said, I wish he would send those pictures to me before he would put them on Facebook and let me pick what I want him to post. And don't you wish that would be the way in life? Now, sometimes we cannot pick what people post. Have you ever looked at your old family photos and think, that wasn't what was really going on when that picture was taken? There's a story behind the story about why that picture was taken. And I have a picture I want to post. It was many years ago. I have black hair back in the day. And... Um, that's my three sisters and my brother, and I look like a giant in that picture. I'm, I'm eight inches taller than anybody else in my family. And uh, uh, that was at my mom and dad's 50th wedding anniversary. And um, my two sisters in the middle, uh, I just got done talking to them around the table drinking coffee. And both of those ladies were going through a divorce at the time. And they were struggling. They were crying. They were hurting. And guess what somebody said? Hey, family, let's take a picture. They said, just a second. They got off that table and they were cleaning their eyes and they were, got ready and they, they were trying to look decent and they stood up there with a smile on their face taking a picture that they did not want to be taken because just because that picture says, what a nice family, that family was in chaos at that time. Oh, I like my double-breasted suit. <laughs> it was a long time ago. But every time I look at that picture, I don't see the family. I see the pain that those ladies were going through. And I was a young pastor. They went to their brother and they said, Bruce, we need to talk to you. And we sat and talked all afternoon long. So just because it's a picture doesn't mean the picture tells the whole story. 
A picture can paint a thousand, thousand words and paint a lot of pictures, but it does not tell the story. So when you look at a story, what does that story mean? I found a picture, you can turn that off, but I found a picture that uh, I didn't want to post. It was a picture of the last time my dad was here. We were, all the family was there. And they took a picture of my dad and the family. And uh, my mom just had a stroke. And my dad was there, and my brothers and sisters were there. And they took a picture. And that picture stood still. But life moved on. I can go in my house right now and look exactly where that picture was taken. And I can remember my dad being right there. A picture of my brothers and my sister. And their life has moved on, and they were in chaos but they were here at this moment of time. And it changes everything. Just because we take a picture doesn't mean that picture is a reality. And in our life, I want to use three simple points today. And I want to Instagram, but I want to call it Insta Fam. Because our family has issues. And when we look at social media and we're posting pictures, and we understand that pictures are not truthful. What's truthful is the life that we live beyond the pictures that we take. Because the life that we live changes eternity. A picture stands still. Whenever you're going through pictures for weddings or funerals, and David and Janice are, David and Janice are right here, and their mother just passed away, um, Joanne, uh, Stroth just passed away last week and the funeral is here on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock and I'd love to have our church support. They were members here for 50 years, served in many different capacities here at the church. But as you're going through pictures, uh, you're going through pictures for a funeral, you're going through pictures just for your own memory, pictures captivate a moment, but it doesn't define a life. It talks about a time and space of an event but it doesn't say what the story was behind that event. There are no such thing as perfect family pictures. There are no such thing as a perfect family picture. Now, you take a picture today, and then you try to post that, and you say, well, I can't use that picture because John and, and uh, Janice got divorced, and John is in that picture, and now Janice is married to Bill, so Bill will get mad if we use that picture, so I can't use that picture. So we used to be able to cut them out, but now we don't cut them out. We Photoshop, we Photoshop Bill backward. I mean, it's just crazy. But there's no perfect family picture. We can never get anyone to look good all at the same time when you have little kids, right? Everybody moves around, everybody's hyper, and you can't get everybody to stop and take that picture. Because in our life, Stuff happens, and we try to get that moment, that perfect picture, that perfect family, and it doesn't take place. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says this, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do you ever realize that scrolling through social media, you think that they must have that perfect family, or they must have that perfect marriage. They must have those perfect kids. And that doesn't take place. They may be able to stage something perfectly, but doesn't mean that they are perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect family. There's no such thing as a perfect picture. We post those pictures, though. We post those pictures because we want a thought of a reality of us, because we get our identity about what people think of us, instead of what reality truly is of us. You know, in the Bible, I, I searched this. There are no perfect families. There's no perfect families in the Bible, which clearly that means there's no perfect families here. I just listed a few. Well, let's look at the first family. Eve tricked Adam into disobeying God. And then Cain killed his brother Abel. 
And then Cain ran away. Jacob's family. Jacob had 12 brothers and decided to buy his youngest one, Joseph, a designer's coat. And his brothers sold him into slavery. Then they wanted to kill him, but they didn't kill him. He was sold, but he was rescued. King Saul, Israel's first king, was jealous of the popularity of a shepherd boy by the name of David and wanted to kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, loved David. And Jonathan rescued David out of the hands of Saul. And Saul and Jonathan, son and father, were estranged because of that event. What about King David's family? He thought, oh, he was the most popular man in the Old Testament. But yet, King David had an affair. King David didn't have a good family. What about Solomon's family? The smartest guy who ever lived had multiple wives and multiple girlfriends. He may be smart mentally, but he was crazy in life. <laughs> Stupid, if you would. And Jesus' family. <laughs> Look at this. When Jesus was 12 years old, his mom and dad, if he was 12 years old today, his mom and dad would probably be charged with abandonment and abuse. Because when he was 12 years old, he was at the temple. And his mom and dad was traveling back to their home. Where's Jesus? He was left. And that happened today, and you left your child at 12 years old, and you were a two or three day drive away. You would think, Mom, Dad, do you know who I am? I'm the Savior of the world. And you left me back in the temple. Well, Paul's family, Paul was a single man. Paul decided to be single. And Paul was a great man, but he had no family. So we look at that. Just because you're single does not mean that God cannot use you. God can use you in multiple ways, in multiple abilities. There's no perfect family in the Bible. It's hard to believe that there'd be a perfect family here. You probably had fights and disappointments and even divorce, rebellious kids and even black sheep of the family. The mother-in-law that has no boundaries and maybe a daughter-in-law that thinks that she's the only one that can raise kids correctly. We don't want anybody to see our flaws, but we want them to see our opinions. There are no perfect family pictures. But here's the other one. There's no such thing as a completed family picture. Just because it's not perfect doesn't mean it's always going to be completed because always in our life, things move on. There was a day where these two couples actually liked each other. I'm supposed to get a laugh out of that because they don't like each other anymore, do they? But they could sit and they can smile and that picture is all over the internet and you looked at them in that picture and not know the story behind the picture, you would think, those two couples like each other. And those two couples can't stand each other. Seldom does the story of the picture told by the picture. In that moment of time, it is captivated for the future. Photos capture a moment in time and not the reality of time. We tend to make choices, never really consider what the effect of that choice will be of that time in that picture. When I was thinking of this, I thought of my life. 20 years ago, 19 years ago to be exact, I made a decision. I made a decision to leave Springfield, Missouri and to come to Wichita, Kansas. Simple decision. It only impacted my wife and I, right? Except for we have been here 19 years and my, both of my boys went from kindergarten through high school at the same school. Brett, he's 24 years old now, grew up in this church, met his wife in this church, and now they're married, and now hopefully after a few years they're going to have some kids and grandkids. But their life was changed by my life, and everything about them was changed because I made a decision to leave Springfield to come to Wichita, and everything about my kid's life changed when I made a decision. Same thing with you. Every decision that you make never just impacts you. 
It impacts your kids and your grandkids. We have to think generationally instead of a moment in time. I saw some pictures of me when I first became pastor here. I was young and skinny, and um, my kids were like one year old and five year old. It was a cute little family. But everything changes. Now you take a picture of me and I'm balded, white-headed, and fat. My boys are 24 and 19 years old. They're off to college. They're both in love. Everything changes. What would have happened? Who would have they married? Where would they have gone to school? What would have happened if I did not make a decision to come here? Their life would have changed and my life would have changed. So in our decisions, in our snapshots of life, we have to realize that our pictures are never complete when we take a picture. Things happen. Jobs happen. Everything changes. In Psalms chapter 127, verse 3, it says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children in one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, they shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. It is an honor to have our kids. It's an honor to have our grandkids. It's an honor to look into the future of what God can do with them. And if you're single, what God can do with you into the future. It's an honor to have our kids. But we have to understand, when you take that snapshot of life with your kids, the snapshot stays put but their life moves on. We cannot live our life in the past. We must live our life for the future. Have you ever thought that sometimes that God, God wants us to really consider the choices that we make? God really wants us to consider our lifestyles. Sometimes we have to remember that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And his ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes he gives us the word of God to understand that he loves us and he wants to make our decisions properly for us. And every choice that we make has to be baptized by the word of God. And just because we baptize our choices in the word of God, God can come alongside us and help us. But when we are disobedient to the choices that we make, we must understand we are generationally thinking Generationally means this, every choice that I make can change the outcome of my life and my kid's life and their kid's life for generations. So when I make proper choices by the hand of God, and that snapshot of time is this picture right now, it is standing still, but my kids are moving on. I must understand. What is the idea of disobedience? When God asks me to make a proper choice, and I do not make that choice, and disobedience comes within my heart, and within my life, everything changes. Everything that my kids do, everything that I do, has ramifications. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, it says, This is the love for God to obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In John 14, 15, If you love me, you will do what I've commanded you. In John 14, 21, Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by the Father and to love him and show himself to him. When you're disobedient, we're just saying, I don't care what God says. I care what I want. I want to look good in the picture, but I don't care what the reality of that picture truly is. See, if we only care what people think of us, we only care that we look good. We only care what people's perception of us really are. We, that's a perfect family, or they look really good. We are not doing what God truly wants us to do. But to be obedient instead of disobedient, it means this. If you can really make that huge choice and do what God wants us to do, are we truly a Christ follower or not? Do we obey God's word or not? Are we being faithful to our spouse or not? Do we have a controlling mouth or not? Containing your anger or not? Forgiving someone or not? Battle addictions or not? Making healthy choices or not? Deciding to give up or to quit? When we're obedient to God, we will stand and fight for what God has called us to do. Every choice you make, every decision you make, 
We have to start thinking generationally instead of a moment in time. It starts with a picture. It starts with a decision. I am not going to do this again. And you may have to make that decision every morning of your life. And the Bible says, die daily to ourself. In other words, I may take a new snapshot of my life every day. But I have to throw that old snapshot away. And this is my reality. I have to think generationally that my kids are going to live their life because of a decision I have made. But you have to remember this last point. There's no such thing as an unfixable family picture. God has the ultimate Photoshop in heaven. And when we goof up our picture, God can fix our pictures of life. And sometimes we really goof up some of our pictures, don't we? Sometimes we get photobombed by people that we don't even know and that can really goof up a perfect setting within our life. And we look at those pictures and we say, what in the world just took place within my life? In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony that they did not love their lives to the death. What does it mean to have a broken picture? What does it mean to have a life that is broken? What does it mean to go through your photo album that you took five years ago or ten years ago and you start going through those memories and your photo is broken? Maybe somebody died. Maybe somebody left. Maybe somebody caused major pain. And you take that picture, and instead of loving that picture, you see a broken picture. One that is stained and hurt. And you look at that and say, there's no way I can fix that picture. And we have to understand there's no way you can fix that picture. But there's no picture that is ever taken that God cannot fix. God cannot love and God cannot change. He finds a bunch of good ones, a bunch of good pictures within your life. And he starts letting you see the good within your life. And he starts allowing you to forgive yourself. And when we can start forgiving ourselves, then we can start forgiving others. But sometimes in our life, today's this idea, they call it selfies. We take a selfie, even a selfie stick, and we get a bunch of people in the selfie. But we take that selfie, and we look at that selfie, and we think, this is my life. I look good. And we get our identity from a selfie that we take, and we post the selfie so everybody will see the selfie. And what everybody does with the selfie is what? I like it. If I can get 20, 30, 40 likes with my selfie, I look good today. But as soon as that selfie is taken, our life is different. But we get our identity, what others think of us, where we need to get our identity of what God thinks of us. Because if God loves us and we love God, our identity is God can help me through this. It may be my family, but my family moves on. But God will never leave us, and he will never, ever, ever hurt us. Remember the church directory days where you go in, and, and uh, you take a picture, and, and uh, they, they have a bunch of tables in the back, and they try to upsell you on all, the photo shot, all these photos. And you can buy this for $19.95, but if you buy this, you can have the whole set for $69. And you say, I don't, I just want the directory. But they try to upsell you. So they pass out the directories. And you get one at the church and you go through the, the directories. And you say, That's a perfect family. Isn't that family so cute? And you say, I didn't know they went to church here. Or I didn't know they left the church here. And there's always, always the memories of the church directory. I remember the directory. I was a youth pastor in Arlington, Texas. And we did this church directory. And this family was in our church, and the high school boy was in my class. And they took this picture, and you look at this picture, you would say, wow, the dad's a good-looking dude, the mom's fairly attractive, and <laughs> whatever. I was going to say hot, but I didn't want to get in trouble. She's fairly attractive. And they had the two boys, and they were good-looking, handsome boys. And you looked at that and said, that's a good-looking family. 
until you know the story behind the picture. Dad was a controlling jerk, abusive, former athlete that thought he could still do everything and was mad that his kids did not live up to what he thought they should live. And he abused them, beat them, turned into an alcoholic, and the kids absolutely hated their dad. So as soon as the boys graduated from high school, they graduated for their home. And the boy got baptized into his own work and started working so hard, he never talked to his dad. That anger and that bitterness that was in that boy's life overwhelmed him 10 years after he graduated from high school and he committed suicide. A boy that was in my youth ministry that you look at the picture and you say, what a perfect family was just a stinking picture that had no reality behind it. But it looked good. It looked good. Everybody thought it was great. But it's just a lying, stinking picture. That we want everybody to think our life and our family is perfect. But God does great things. God can change us and he can love us, and he can help us. You know, even the genealogy of Jesus was goofed up. We talked a few weeks ago, even Bathsheba was the great-great-grandmother of Jesus. There's no perfect families, but what we have to do is we have to not allow a snapshot of time to take place of what God wants to do within our life. I use this illustration, and I want to close with it. Here's what Satan does at your worst moment when you sinned the most. When you were in a fight that captivated and hurt somebody. He wants to do this. He wants to take a snapshot of your life at its worst. And he wants you to put that snapshot of your worst moment when you felt the worst or you sinned the greatest and he wants to put that on your refrigerator door. And he wants you to say this. It'll never get any better than this. This is who you are. This is what you did. They will never love you. They will never forgive you. You are worthless. And he wants you to look at that every day. And he wants you to put that in your heart and within your mind. And any time that you try to get out of that picture, he wants to bring you back into that picture and say, this is who you are. But this is what God wants you to do. That's who you were. We have all sinned. We have all come short of the glory of God. But God forgives you. God loves you. And you need to take that stinking picture that Satan put on your refrigerator door and you need to crumple that stupid picture up and throw it away by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am not that person anymore. So often, we get caught up in what we did. We cannot do what God wants us to do because we believe the lie of Satan to say that picture, my mental picture of who I was, will never be forgiven. And in order to be forgiven... I have to get rid of it and get it out of my mind. The Bible says I need to renew my mind by the cleansing of the Word of God. And when you cleanse your mind, that snapshot of what Satan wants you to believe, you do it through the Word of God and the forgiveness of God, and you can baptize yourself in the holiness and the forgiveness of Christ, and you can look at Satan and say this, Get thee behind me. Who I was is not going to determine who I'm going to be. I was different then. I had an encounter with Christ. I have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am not going to be hampered by my past. I'm going to be exalted into my future. But we have to stand up. And we have to say this. Any picture that I take, any life that I have, anything that I have done is not a picture that God cannot change. He is the greatest Photoshop in the world. And he can take our mess-ups, our goof-ups, our failures, and he can fix them. But what do we do with it? And this is going to be a tough one in our society today, in our social media society. We care so much 
of what people think of us. How many likes did I get? Did they like this or did they like that or did somebody make a comment about this? We are so caught up in what people think instead of caught up on what God thinks. Because if we get caught up in obeying the love and the forgiveness of God, I want people to like me, but I need Jesus to love me. I'm not going to get my identity whether this church likes everything that I do, but I'm going to get my identity whether I do everything God wants me to do. And if we love God and we keep his word, God says he's going to overwhelm us with his love and his protection and his blessing. Snapshots, pictures. They can paint a thousand different words with a single picture. But they don't tell the true story. And the true story is not what is seen in the picture. Because every picture has lies. Every picture has a filter. And most pictures are staged. What happens if we take the picture, if Jim Patton takes your picture? There's no staging. There's no filter. It's just reality. Live our life in reality. Live our life so in that reality, people will look at us who we truly are. Pleasing unto God, honoring Him, doing what He wants us to do. They may take a picture, and you may not look very flattering in the picture. But the picture is reality. That's where we need to live our life. Not in a facade, not in a joke, but genuine, open, and honest. Allowing God to forgive us where we have failed him. And allowing God to change us and move us, transform us, and take care of us. That's what we have to do. It's just a picture. But the picture stands still. Life moves on. Don't let the picture define your future. Allow God to change your future.